Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome to the Practically Preparing for Ramadan workshop. Alhamdulillah, we have Ustad Hussein and Imam Daud Yaseen and myself presenting. We thank you guys for your attendance, inshallah, and we're going to begin with Ustad Hussein on mentally preparing and emotionally being feeling ready for the everything that encompasses Ramadan, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen. Sayyidina wa mawlana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Uh, we are in the final stretch uh, before this blessed month of Ramadan next week. So this is a time where a lot of people are, again, just preparing for the month. Uh, just yesterday, subhanAllah, I had three different sessions all on preparation for the month of Ramadan. So um, with that said, I was asked to speak a little bit about uh, a topic that I love, emotional intelligence, as it relates to Ramadan. So some of you may not know what emotional intelligence is. Um, and what it is, is basically in the most simplest terms, it's a framework that helps you to manage your emotions, identify and manage your emotions, and then also help other people manage their emotions. And um, one of the really simple acronyms that you could learn just to kind of stick, or to have that uh, definition stick, is ARM. Because A is, um, the, the A stands for awareness, so to become really self-aware of yourself. And then the R relates to regulating your emotions. And then the M um, is for managing emotions, of course your own as well as other people. So when you become more emotionally intelligent, you really work on honing uh, in these skills. And um, I came across this framework several years ago, and as soon as I started reading it, it just instantly spoke to me because I found that everything that they were describing was really just applying Islam. If we actually learn our deen and apply it, we will become emotionally intelligent. And so that just, you know, I, I started to delve into it deeper, and the more and more I looked into it, I was convinced that this was a really great modern tool to help to teach people really deen and tarbiyah and, and the prophetic wisdoms of our, uh, of our tradition, alhamdulillah. So um, years later, when I was speaking to uh, Sheikh Hamza, he actually told me about a hadith that uh, really was incredible when, I, when he said it to me, because I, I, I had always thought of this concept of emotional, in, uh, emotional intelligence being something that was modern, right? In 1990, it was discovered. Um, and then we have uh, Daniel Goleman, who's the kind of leading pioneer on the topic. He's the one who really put it on the map, right, that term. Well, that's what I thought until Sheikh Hamza mentioned this hadith where he, uh, he said, the Prophet ﷺ said, رَأْسُ الْأَقْلِ بَعْدَ الْإِيمَانِ التَّوَدُّدُ إِلَى النَّاسِ which is that, um, you know, after, the basis of reasoning after faith is, uh, you know, is, is loving kindness towards people. And subhanAllah, that was amazing because he is connecting intelligence and, again, emotional management, right, of other people. So, in fact, uh, which shouldn't surprise us, right, because a lot of these modern ideas that we are um, impressed by, if you actually dig a little deeper, you find that they do have uh, roots in tradition and in religion and subhanAllah, especially when it comes to our faith because it is so, um, it's so deep and it covers so many of these wonderful topics that there's always, you know, you'll always find connections. And just actually yesterday or the day before on, on Instagram, I posted about this very thing that a lot of the modern tools that we use um, in fact have traditional roots in our faith. So alhamdulillah, I wanted to now just talk about more about how we can understand emotional intelligence practically and then tie it to Ramadan. So um, we, I already gave you the, the definition of it now. The qualities that you want to develop to become emotionally intelligent are five. And this is, a, again, according to the works of Daniel Goleman. So the first is to become self-aware, which I mentioned. The second is self-regulation. The third is motivation. The fourth is empathy, and then the fifth is social skills. And if you really look at each one of them, subhanAllah, you'll find that they do actually, um, they are skills that we should absolutely have every day of the year, but certainly in the month of Ramadan, uh, because the month of Ramadan, again, is a time where we really are being put to the test, right? We should see it as that. It's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity to really 
bring out the best of, wh of whatever is suppressed within us because a lot of times during the year, of course, with work and schedules and all of the other routines that we get bogged down by, we uh, that part of us, that true essence of our nature, which is, of course, our soul, gets lost. And so Ramadan is a time for it to emerge and for us to really discover a lot about ourselves and our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And emotional intelligence, if you understand it and apply it, it can certainly help you. So for example, the first quality, right, to become self-aware, what does that mean? Well, um, you know, first and foremost, at a certain point, and you know, I work a lot with youth, and I think it's imperative that parents and educators teach youth, uh, you know, all of the, of course, the, the regular education that we want them to have, but also really to help them understand themselves. And so temperament, for example, is something that we, uh, you know, for, for historically always taught, you know, it was very much a part of our tradition to teach about temperament, mizaj, we, we call it in Arabic, which is to know, like, you know, basically what, you know, what is your, um, what's your blueprint? How do you operate? You know, like, we, we understand operating systems, right? We have devices. Uh, there's the Apple. Uh, iOS camp and then there's the Android camp right and we know we understand that these are two different systems and they have different operating systems well human beings are similar right we, we operate on different wavelengths on different levels we certain things um, appeal to some they don't to others so really focus or understanding yourself for example the most simple you know, definitions that we all should know are, are you an extrovert or an introvert? Because that actually does really help to understand yourself. If you are the type of person that when you're around large settings or, or social settings or there's a lot of stimuli, you feel affected by it and it, it just drains you, you are likely an introverted person. And if you're the opposite, where when you're alone too much, it starts to nag at you and you feel uneasy and you like to be around people, you always have some sounds or something in the background because you don't like silence, then you likely are an extrovert. Just that simple um, understanding of yourself can really help to know what your comfort levels are. For example, you know, Ramadan is a time of community, right? So a lot of people. I mean, now we're in COVID, but uh, outside of that, a lot of times we uh, there is the, the social element, right? Um, and so, some people that's a really attractive thing. Like they can't wait to come to the Taraweeh prayers and the iftars and to go house uh, iftar hopping house to house, you know, during the month because they love connecting with their community, and that's beautiful. And for some people, that's what they need because maybe they've been disconnected. Whereas other people, that doesn't sound as appealing because, again, their nature um, is that they want to retreat. They actually want to be um, at home more. So if you are only receiving one message, though, like let's say you're reading a book or you're listening to a talk and the message is, you should be, you know, congregating and meeting with people and, you know, and reaping the benefits of the, the, the jama'ah, then you may feel lost in that, you know, like what about if I just don't want to, you know, or vice versa, maybe you're on the opposite extreme where you really are going so inward, which of course is your right, but you don't want to meet with anybody and you don't really want to have any social, uh, you know, connection, then maybe you need to find that balance, right, which is really what Again, first becoming self-aware um, is, is, is learning about yourself and, and understanding that nature. But then the second part of it is, where's the balance? Because both of these extremes wouldn't quite fit. We are social, right? Our deen is a social deen, but we also have the element of, um, certainly, of, of halwa, of, of spiritual retreat. And so that's why understanding these things about yourself then takes you gradually to the next step, which is I have to regulate these things. Because if I draw a line and say, well, this is just who I am, and I don't want to participate in this X, Y, or Z, and I'm not really realizing that just because something fits for me or feels right for me, is it right, right? That's really the question. Because the perfect example, of course, is the Prophet and his entire life is known to us because so that we can model ourselves after him. And he showed us um, just how he was able to balance. He, of course, had the ability to, or he, he showed us how to retreat, right? I mean, his entire, you know, beginning of his prophecy was all about his need to, to pull away and to just be isolated and, and to really contemplate and to do all that. And then he also showed us the importance of being social and being in the in the community and being active in the community. So his life is a, is a perfect example of how we can find that balance. But this is what, again, 
being emotionally intelligent does is it kind of forces you to see yourself, right? It forces you to see and understand yourself and then do that compare and contrast with the best of examples of problems I said them. So you, you really pay attention to all of those nuances about you, those little quirks that you have. And, you know, look, where do I need to filter? What do I need to um, enhance and, and, and work on, on, you know, improving? And then what do I need to change? And so with, when you gradually move from self-awareness to self-regulation, which is the second quality, now it's about how do I do that? And that's where a book like, um, like here, I have Purification of the Heart, right? This is an excellent book for anybody who's in the self-regulation phase, which is I need to learn how to control myself, right? And this is also, I mean, by extension, it is a bit of self-awareness too because you have to read these diseases of the heart, which is what the book is about, in order to know what diseases you have. But then they also teach you how to control that, right? How to rid yourself of the diseases. So the, the you know, the... We have in our tradition Tazkiyah, which is the science of purifi purification, you know, purifi purifying one's soul, one's heart, one's tongue. There's a lot of emphasis on action, right, where you are aware of what the problems are, and now you have to do the actions that follow. And so that is where, you know, the second quality of emotional intelligence comes in. And this is a lifelong pursuit. Like when we talk about Tazkiyah, it's not something that you just do once and then you're done with. Every single one of us, every single day, of our lives have to work on this. And Ramadan is actually a time where we're kind of catapulted, right, uh, in, in, into this work because all of these things start to emerge. You're going to start to see maybe some bad habits come out because, you know, it's it's normal, right? You're cut off from your your normal routines, your your coffee in the morning, uh, whatever, um, you know, cravings you have and, and or sleep is interrupted. So th those, uh, you know, changes can definitely affect our mood and our behavior. And so we're going to start to see maybe some negative qualities within ourselves, right? Maybe we're less patient. We're, we're hangry, as they say. And we, we kind of, you know, in the beginning need to kind of pay attention, like what's going on here and realize that all of that is part of that filtration process. It has to come out. Like, let it all come out and then find your your balance and rhythm because you, you realize that this is, you know, the month to do that and maximize your time in um, in all of the things that we're taught to do, right? Prayers, ibadah, dhikr, Quran, all of that is to help us to manage that. So self-regulation, when it, when and, and again, outside of Ramadan is, is all of these things. In Ramadan, it's specific to really using your time wisely. Like your time is so important in, in this blessed month. And um, if you waste it or squander it doing, doing anything um, of no use. For example, yesterday during this workshop that I had, there was a brother who was, mashallah, very honest and, and uh, may Allah bless him and reward him because he was vulnerable. And he shared with everybody that one of his struggles is that he actually watches a lot of television during Ramadan. And it's something that he, um, he just, he doesn't like himself doing it. He actually hates that he does it, but he's kind of, I think, habituated to that. And, you know, it's a way to buy time there's, there's sometimes the days are so drawn out and the hunger can overwhelm you. So we turn to these different mediums to escape. And so he was saying that that's what he does. And he was really sitting with a lot of guilt with that. So I just, you know, I, I wanted to sympathize because, you know, he was isolated from his community. He didn't have a car to be able to do certain things. So there are people who are in circumstances like that. And that's why we have to be compassionate in the way we answer to people. But I just told him that, okay, so if that's something you're struggling with, then maybe the rule that you have for yourself, and this is where, again, he had to regulate, he has to regulate himself, is that you're going to do it better. You know, if you, if you want to watch TV, for example, or social media, then just have a rule that says I'm not going to indulge in things that I know are absolutely wasteful and harmful um, or completely haram, but maybe educational, maybe beneficial. And there are options for us. So, you know, kind of put, imposing that uh, rule upon yourself that in this month the time is so precious that even if I have these you know, weaknesses that, uh, you know, I'm going to try to um, somehow, you know, work around them and make sure that I am not, uh, again, harming myself or squandering this the time of this month. So that's, you know, self-regulation. And then we have, you know, the third quality, which is motivation. Um, and there's so much to say about each of these. By the way, I'm, you know, just because of our comments are brief here, I, I can't get into all of them. But there's, I've done several talks on this before. But just in the context of Ramadan, you know, to be motivated, I love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, you know, kind of uh, has has made the reward of, of Ramadan mysterious to us. Like, we really have no idea, 
just what uh, the rewards are. And he even in, in one verse says that the fast is best for you if only you knew. And I love just even the phrasing of that because it's really, you know, helping us to understand that there are things that we, there, there's a lot of things that we don't know, right? But when it comes to the reward of our fast and the sacrifice of, of the fast that we're doing and all of the other things that we do, our charity, our prayers, our du'as in this month, they are secrets only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that, I think, serves as a great motivator in that all of the things that we second guess about ourselves, that we feel a lot of self-doubt about and you know, guilt over our past, is that this is a reset. This is the ultimate reset. And that's why when we have the gift of witnessing Ramadan, we really have to look at it as like, a, you know, this is a... Um, a um, you know an extension right it's 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 an opportunity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us to reach back and, and 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 to get closer to him but he's extending the opportunity to us it's a gift it's a windfall right because it's time it's 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 so it's it's so much uh, there's so much barakah like I said that we can't really um, know but to have that as a motivating factor and then of course you know to look at the um, I mean to when you're reading all of the beautiful commentary on just the rewards of the month and the different times, for example, when you're breaking your fast. When you're waking up for tahajjah, then you're praying at those times, those beautiful uh, times of, uh, again, intimacy with, uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then all of the other wor deeds that we're doing, just that there's this, again, this, um, this you know, this, uh, this mystery to it, but it's it's for for us to incentive to be incentivized to do those things, and so just to find those um, you know uh, to, to to pursue those deeds and also to increase our um, our reading of the book of Allah Subhanahu. This is probably I mean it is it's a, we all know that Ramadan is the month of the Quran. It's it's the month that we are supposed to really connect with the book of Allah Subhanahu. So that's also another really important part of being motivated is that you know finding goals that connect you to uh, the the Quran, and so. If you can read the Quran, alhamdulillah, then a good motivating um, thing to do, just keep yourself going. And if you're part of the masjid, even coming to the taraweh and praying those prayers and doing a khatam of the Quran should be something that gets you up every day. Like I, it's another day to, you know, again, uh, finish my juz, whether I'm reading it myself or I'm co coming to the taraweh and I'm listening to it or I'm listening to it at home. There are a multitude of ways that we can really have that connection. But having these goals, right, this sense of accomplishment is also one, a way that we can feel motivated. So that's the third quality. Then the fourth quality has to do with empathy. And I love this, um, you know, because I remember when I was younger and we learned about uh, Ramadan, that always stuck with me, even as a student, in, in a, a Muslim student in a class in seventh, eighth grade, when the, uh, you know, the, um, the chapters or the, Oh, in, in class when we would start talking about Islam and, and this topic of Ramadan would come up, that it was always framed uh, as, you know, Muslims fast in Ramadan as obviously an act of worship, but also uh, to sympathize, right, with other people who are uh, hungry and who are, you know, in these impoverished states. So it was always framed as an action that Muslims do to bring about this concept of empathy. And I, I really appreciated that growing up. And, um, and even now, I think we all know that that's one of the central reasons why we, uh, we fast, just with, you know, withholding all of these indulgences that we partake in every single day of the year for a month, uh, and not even the entire month, by the way. It's just during daylight hours, right? Because sometimes we, we forget that, um, you know, once the sun sets, people do tend to kind of default sometimes into those habits. But just those daylight hours with restricting yourself, withholding yourself, um, so that you can feel the pangs of hunger, so that you can really realize that there are, you know, millions, um, if not billions of people in the world who are in that circumstance, but it's not a choice for them. It's not something to do as an option. This is their daily reality, and they don't really have, uh, you know, a, a huge uh, iftar or, or a suhoor waiting for them at different intervals, you know, during their day or week or month. They, they just basically survive on what they have. So empathizing uh, with people uh, for, you know, during the fast and also the charity, right? We know that the Prophet was most charitable during the month of Ramadan. And that's also something we should do. So this is the time to really think about all the different organizations or even individuals that you may know that are in need and to, you know, to just put aside all of the things that, we, trivial things that sometimes we, um, again, we, uh, we give into it because, you know, 
buying consumption is enough, right? If you're constantly just, you know, on um, these, now we can shop online, so everything is so easy and convenient, but we do it almost, you know, automatically. We're not even thinking sometimes, oh, I like this, let me go click and buy, and click and buy. And we do that so much, um, and sometimes half of the stuff remains in boxes and we don't even use it, because it's something that, again, it's a modern uh, phenomenon for, for those who are privileged to have that. But it's a time to stop that, right, and to not indulge in that, you know, um, that, that habit and to rather uh, do that for other things, right? Other causes like donations, uh, you know, launch good, whatever campaigns that you see that you want to support, but really amping up your charity for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's, you know, empathy. And there's, again, so much, so much more we can say about all of these qualities. Um, but <clears throat> the last one, uh, the last quality of emotional intelligence is social skills. And that's the other incredible thing is that, again, when you uh, look at the month of Ramadan, we really do have an opportunity to, um, to maximize our uh, growth in all of these five qualities. Because social skills is something that, um, as I mentioned before, we are a deen that, that is a deen of jama'ah. We, uh, we do, uh, you know, encourage being social, um, obviously, to everybody's, you know, ability. But we come together for prayer. We come together for to break our fast. We should, anyway. We, we do a lot of things together. We're fasting together. So the idea of developing those social skills is really important as well. I know during COVID, for example, it's been researched as well that the mask served as a barrier for a lot of people, and it's been a little awkward, right, coming out of that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, that uh, state of just not really having very limited contact with people, not really talking much, to suddenly being back into your community, it, it's hard for some people, especially if their temperament um, is is more introverted. But we do have to remember that, you know, the Prophet I said I'm in the most difficult times was always accessible, and he was always smiling. It was, you know, so many descriptions of him always describe him as having the most cheerful disposition, welcoming, warm, um, giving the salams we know, of course, it's sunnah, replying is, is fard. Um, just knowing these basic rules about, you know, when you're with in gatherings, for example, you know, if you're in a pair, you don't talk uh, secretly or in a language that uh, the, a third person or other people wouldn't know around you. You don't want to exclude people. So anything that, um, that you know, reminds us to not be, uh, to, to, to be responsible when we're in social settings is really important. And everybody has to, again, look at where the area that they need to work on. But it's something um, that is easily uh, managed if you're just, again, reading the sunnah and really internalizing his way and starting to Adopt this attitude that everything that I do that is in conflict with the way of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not good enough. And I need to undo that and adopt his way because this is how, you know, I mean, it's just a fact that if you want to be a better human being, then the only path to do that is to follow his way. And so really accepting that and um, and working on that in the month of Ramadan in all of these areas, right? Um, so alhamdulillah, there's, again, so much to say about emotional intelligence. I, I definitely encourage um, all of us to know about this framework, to understand it. And if you have young children, even as young as preteens or adolescents, I teach th these classes to that demographic for a reason, because it's a tool. This is a skill set. And the earlier they can learn it and develop it, the better it will be for them in every area of their life. Because again, it helps them to really appreciate the value of our deen and the Prophet example, because all of these beautiful wisdoms were, were given to us centuries ago um, by way of his teachings. And so, alhamdulillah, um, you know, I, I encourage everyone to look into this. I encourage everyone to, inshallah, really work on managing themselves um, and in, in this month because this is really what uh, Ramadan is about. And uh, on that note, I wanted to actually share, for those of you who may have this, uh, the book Purification of the Heart, one of the um, appendices in the, in the, in the, in the, at the end of the book is actually entirely on Ramadan. And it's uh, it's an excellent. There's an excellent section here that um, I really think everybody should read. It's it's a, a few pages, but there's a part here that I wanted to just um, read for all of you, inshallah. So, <clears throat> Bismillah. The lure to, to lure the believer into doubt is Satan's game. 
To protect oneself from this is a personal responsibility. We are explicitly told that Satan's guile is weak and that he has no authority except over those who choose to make themselves vulnerable and who are deluded. So to shield against Satan's whisperings, one must guard one's creed and sound belief and shun shady devices. This entails confirming one's worship with the sunnah or established practice of the Prophet ﷺ. It requires deepening one's knowledge in Islam and its various sciences. If Satan sees that he cannot assail one in matters of creed and belief, he then comes through the door of shahawat, lust and desire. Our desires are integral parts of normal creation and function, but when they evolve into masters that we consciously or unconsciously serve, this is a problem that can become severe enough to drag us outside the fold of guidance. For Satan, this door can be lucrative, especially with consumers of media who receive a steady stream of messages that make licentiousness and excessiveness appear normal. The Prophet ﷺ told his companions to be wary of Satan and his designs, for he flows in man's veins. Just as alcohol flows in the blood, delivering its debilitating effects to the brain, liver, and other organs, so too do Satan's machinations and enticements. The Prophet ﷺ said that fasting is half of patience, and patience is a quality indispensable for a successful life and afterlife. Satan traffics impatience and despair, while fasting exposes the folly of both. The scholars of spiritual purification advise this, be patient with regard to food, which is the primary urge, and with regard to sex, which is the secondary urge. Conquer these two, the rest becomes easy. There is another hadith stating that patience is half of iman, so fasting is a quarter of iman. There is yet another hadith stating that God the exalted multiplies the reward for a good action 10 to 700 times except for fasting. Fasting is my own and I shall reward it, which indicates the enormity of the reward for proper fasting. God says, those who are patient shall be rewarded without measure in chapter 39 verse 10. Fasting and patience are deeply rooted. Patience too is an important key to the opening of favors from God. Alhamdulillah. And there's so much more in this amazing chapter on Ramadan, so I advise everyone who has the book Purification of the Heart by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf to please read that section as a good review in preparation for this month. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again in, enable all of us and gift all of us and bless all of us with the ability to witness the coming of this blessed month of Ramadan, inshallah. Allahumma balighna Ramadan. Allahumma balighna Ramadan. Allahumma balighna Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the best Ramadan of our lives. May he accept our fast, our prayers, our du'as, our charity, our dhikr, our recitation of the Qur'an. May he fortify our hearts and our faith. May he give us conviction in our faith. And may, we, may he guide our children and give them strength in, in their identity as Muslims. And inshallah, bring sakina and blessing to our homes. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. Jazakumullahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah mifta' alayna fatula arifin. Wa fiqna tawfiqa salihin. Wa anfa'an lahum bil-Qur'ani wa dhikr al-Hakim. Allahumma alimna ma yunfa'na. Wa anfa'an liba alamtana. Wa zidna imu wa amulan mutaqabla. Wa jikir kirim ya Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'altahu sahlan. Wa anta tajal hazna idha shidda sahlan. اللهم أعذنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا واصلح مرنا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلي اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله I've been asked just to share a few thoughts on Ramadan and and this idea that, um, you know, kind of a preparation, but preparation in a way that, that perhaps excites us. And I think um, in starting off for this Ramadan, this is special. Uh, every Ramadan is special, no doubt. But I would say for me um, that this is something special in particular 
because this Ramadan for me now marks um, two, two lives, if you will. So I became Muslim when I was 26, and now this year becomes my 26th Ramadan. So I have half of my life as a non-Muslim and half of my life now as a Muslim. And I say that because I want to share with you that in, in this month, you know, we perhaps, shaitan tries this kind of like one last assault to create doubt. Right? If he can't get us not to fast, he's going to get us to have, he's going to try and work on us to have doubt. That's his game. And I think about, you know, what life was like, you know, kind of right up to that first time that you fast. And whatever doubts that a person may have, uh, you can say with absolute sincerity, I'm sorry, with absolute yaqeen, that whatever you think you can't do, with the intention, Allah will see you through it. Like whatever you think you can't do, that Allah will see you through that. And as I think about this month, I want to share with you just some thoughts um, of some notes that I wrote um, some time ago, but I think that they are appropriate. And I think about this month, it's as if we are hosting a most unique, most honored, and most generous guest. And it's a guest that we are blessed to host once a year for the duration of a month. The guest arrives at, a portent, at an appointed time and departs at an appointed time. And the beauty of this guest is that it brings the most sought after gifts for the spiritual aspirant, right? If we are aspiring in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this guest brings the most sought after gifts. It brings God's mercy and generosity and disperses it to those who avail themselves to it like no other time of the year. It brings us deeds that draw us nearer to our Lord and His pleasure in His garden like no other time in the year. It distances us from the hellfire and protects us from shaitan and his waswas like no other time in the year. It brings with the fragrance of the garden. It brings life to our hearts with the, eter with the eternal speech of the ever-living creator, uh, creator of the Qur'an, obviously, we're talking about here. And that fills our homes with families, friends, and loved ones. And I think about this one um, aspect here in terms of, in terms of um, protects us from shaitan and his misgivings. Because what we find in this game is that shaitan will tell us something, or whisper something to us, and either we're going to listen to it or we're not. And that's the game. And normally what we have learned from our scholars and from what we understand from our tradition is that shaitan will normally just kind of put something forward to you once, and if you don't respond to it, he'll move on to something else. But the nafs, the nafs will continue to kind of pull, push you towards that thing or pull you towards that thing. And so we think about Ramadan, as I said, and this kind of uh, protection from shaitan, the beautiful hadith, right? فُتِحَ الْأَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ وَأُغْلَقَ الْأَبْوَابُ الْجَحَنَّمِ وَصُوصِلَ الشَّيَاطِينَ Like what a gift that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah says, that the that at Ramadan the the that the doors of Jannah are flung open, and the doors of Jahannam are locked, and the shayateen are chained, and so our teachers taught taught us that all that is good will be pouring out from heaven, and that's the gift of this month, and all. Energy, if you will, this is a term that we will use in this way just for the description of this, of negativity or any type of, um, a ne we'll just call it a negative aspect, which uh, the doors of Jahannam, uh, they are closed. 
and the those types of whisperings from shaitan are closed off and it says that all of this is to aid one to not be distracted in the month and i just thought that is just so incredible right like everything is multiplied in this month of the actions that we're doing and then i'm going to make it easier for you to even do it in this month and so i think about this in terms of of a gift right so this guest is ramadan the month of quran the month of Layat al-Qadr, the month of mercy, the month of forgiveness, the month of liberation from the hellfire, right? The month of patience, the month of reflection, the month of reflection and renewed spiritual commitment, the month of charity for the under-resourced and solidarity with the underserved, the month when the deeds are multiplied, the month of the pre-dawn meals of, of suhoor, and the month of qiyam and tarawih. And I just think to myself, like, you know, when when we are um, um, having a relationship with his guest, um, I'm reminded of the tradition of the one who believes in Allah. Man kana yu'min billahi wal yawm al-akhir, man kana yu'min billahi wal yawm al-akhir, fa yukrim jaruhu. That the one who believes in Allah in, his last, in the last day, last day, then let him honor his neighbor. Wa man kana yu'min billahi wal yawm al-akhir, fa yukrim um, yeah, no, for you could And um, so, um, and then also in another uh, um, uh, meaning as well too. Then let him honor his guest, right? Man kana yom bil amnaqif for you kum abayfuhu, right? Let him honor um, his guest. So here, um, the question is, how yeah, are we upholding our obligation and honoring our guests of Ramadan? That's the question that I want us to ask. Like, if we know that a guest is coming, what preparations do we make? Make sure everything is in order. We might even hire somebody to clean the house and take care of all of these things and all these affairs. Now we have this month coming, and we have this house right here. How do we clean this house, and how do we prepare this house for this guest that is coming? So alhamdulillah, as we think about this month, to think about it, you know, in that way. And as, mashallah, our sister... Uh, um, Hussein mentioned here um, that there is emotional intelligence uh, that is required. Um, you know, I think that there are some practical things as well too, and just in terms of our spiritual um, intelligence that we want to um, think about. One of the things that I was just reading with our students, we've been reading for the past couple of weeks on campus after Vohor each day, We've been reading The Etiquettes of Fasting by Imam Ghazali and his book, al Bidayat Al-Hidayat, The Beginning of Guidance. And one of the things that he said was, um, like, he said, do not approach the, the eating and the meal as if you want to make up for the food that was lost and not eaten throughout the day. He said, because that is the absolute opposite of what the goal and the intention of the month is. Because the whole idea of the month is to um, lessen one's desires. And now, maybe this is going to anger some people, maybe it won't. However, I say that because I give this advice that perhaps we look to simplify our meals during this month. Look to simplify our meals during this Why? Because meals take time. Meal, te meal prep takes time. Shopping takes time. And all of that time, yes, we, are, uh, we want to have a good meal, we want to have that, but just for these 30 days, just for these 30 days, the best 30 days throughout the year, look and see if we can approach this Ramadan with a different type of approach to our food. One that is just sim simple. Now I'll share this with you again. Uh, I don't say in any way to, 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 to say anything other than I just wanted to test to see what this was like. I spent my first 10 days of last Ramadan only on dates and water. 21. 7 at Suhoor, 7 at Iftar, and 7 after Tarawih. And I drank water. And I'm still here. Alhamdulillah, from the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to Allah, not to boast, but to show you what Allah can do, I wanted to go the 30 days, but I felt bad for my family. Because I wasn't joining them in meals. But just because I wanted to say two things I wanted to see. What was the meaning of Aswadain? 
as we hear in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, lived on Dayton water for three months in the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha. Right? So if he can do for three months, can we do 30 days? Now I'm not saying everyone should have dates and water for the entire month. We can try and roast them. We can put them in a curry. We can do <laughs> the different things. I'm just teasing. But what I'm saying is that it showed me what the possible, and the, my schedule didn't change. It's doing all of the things that I had to do. Why? Because then you also understand that with, this is like a, this is a means. But the real, the reality of all things is Allah's tawfiq in this. Because we can eat a king's meal and not be satiated. Or we can have dates and water and get up, have our day, be with our family, be in tarawih, and do all of the other things that we need to do. So in this preparation, maybe in this month spiritually, we look to push ourselves outside of our comfort zone of what we've been. Now Ramadan does that, no doubt. We have to get up at times that we normally don't get up. We have to, you know, uh, uh, be without uh, food and water for times um, that we normally don't. And so within it, um, within it itself, right, Ramadan has the, the, the ability to do that. But let's think about perhaps other things that we're doing that we can begin to eliminate. Because um, as I said, uh, before, and, and I'll share this again, is that, is that as we look at Ramadan, and we look at other aspects of the deen, and Ramadan falls into this category, that Ramadan is proximity to God, it's gaining nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through subtraction. Right? Through subtraction. So if we look for multiple places within our lives of where we can subtract, let's see what this Ramadan will look like. And that we pray, mashallah, that this is, you know, one of the, the if not the greatest Ramadan that we've had. That's not difficult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to filter that. Right? And then one of the things that I'll just end with here, and, 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 and I, 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 I kind of, I feel like I always like to share this, is that we, we, we really become people when Allah says that we really look at this ayah and we really look to, 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 to um, um, what can I say? That we really look to live this verse of Quran. Allah says in, uh, you know, what Allah says in Quran, um, Ya bin Ya Adam, Khudu zinatukum anikuli masjid, wukulu washrubu wala tusrifu in la yuhibul musrifi. That, O oh, children of Adam, adorn yourselves, adorn yourselves um, when you enter into the places of worship, and eat and drink, and do not waste, for he does not love those who waste. And so think about food or other things in this month. Think about this, that maybe I take a few sips of this at iftar, and I set it down, and I walk away. Where is it? What's left inside of the bottle? doesn't matter to me. There's another bottle right there on the counter. I'll just grab another one. Right? So think about this now. That would be considered waste. And I just spent my entire day, got up for tahajjud, prayed, um, had suhoor, made dua, uh, fasted, made my intention, fasted, read Quran, gave charity, made dhikr, visited the sick, attended a janazah, and all of these things that could be possible in one day in Ramadan. Broke my fast, made dua, a dua is mustajab, the, 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 the prayer is accepted. But then, at the time of my meal, I will load my plate up, not eat all of the food, and then throw food away. And Allah just says in Quran that He does not love. So I go through the entire day in a state in which He is pouring out His love because of all of the actions that we did, only to flip it into that side and be in a category that he describes with his own words of saying that he doesn't love those who waste. So maybe let's try to make a promise to ourselves, to Allah, to our community, to our akhirah, to whatever it is, that we look with intentionality that any type of, any morsel of food will not, will be consumed by us. Okay? Now there's one dispensation that I allow, which is if someone else makes you a plate of food. And that is because people, I feel, they misappropriate the sunnah. 
and they say the Prophet ﷺ was generous, so they'll load food and food and food and food and one more scoop and one more scoop and one more scoop onto your plate. And you're looking at it, you're like, I couldn't eat that between now and Tuesday. And then I'm supposed to go pray tarawih and have presents with that, right? And so if that is the case, maybe we can eat a portion of it. Maybe we eat a portion of it after tarawih. I don't know, but I'm just saying that we really look, you get my point, right? We're trying not to, um, you know, um, we're trying to, to, to remove this cognitive dissonance to say, Alhamdulillah, the at'amana wa saqana wa ja'ana min al-Muslimin, make dua and then throw food into the garbage. Right? So this is a challenge that I put out to myself and I put out to all of us here who are present. And inshallah ta'ala, we can pass it on to those who are absent as well too, that this is part of our spiritual preparation. Right? That, we will, that we will commit ourselves to not be people who waste um, um, in this month. And inshallah ta'ala, it becomes habituated and we move forward with that. Bi'idhinillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those are just a few uh, brief thoughts, alhamdulillah, as we prepare for this month. And I think that, you know, alhamdulillah, Sister Hussein, she read the dua at the end. Allahumma barikna fi baqti ilam ayyam wa liyali sha'ban wa balighna ramadan. Allah bless us in the remaining night, days and nights of Sha'ban and allow us to experience, I like that, personally I like that translation, allow us to experience Ramadan with all of its gifts. With all of its gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we know of and that we don't know of. All of the gifts that we know and that we don't know, facilitated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the most generous. Um, and, and, and in this month, um, um, you know, puts out a generosity and deals with us in a way that is just unimaginable. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to, to, to bless this community and, and its organizers of this community and the members of this community to facilitate um, what it does in aiding people to have a beautiful month of Ramadan. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathirin ya rabbil alameen. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa I want to salam alaikum. I want to sincerely thank Ustada Hussein and Imam Daud Yasin because they made my job so much easier, mashallah. It was the perfect prelude into this workshop because when we think about all of the aspirations that we want to accomplish, me, myself, I have four boys, mashallah. I work and I love doing community projects, whether it be with kids or women in building sisterhood. So I realized that coming into Ramadan, I always felt like I was in survival mode and I was tired of it. I said, how can I shift gears and make myself thrive during this time? How can I be inspired by all of these amazing lectures, these inspirational talks, and turn it into a reality within our lives? So alhamdulillah, I, um, I've studied uh, corporate business strategies, and I've also, my passion is analytical tafsir. So tying in a lot of these concepts that we've learned, I formulated a lot of the worksheets in this workbook. So you're going to hear a lot of the repetition of what they've already, mashallah, brought us to, but in formats that we can interpret them into our lives and organize ourselves. So you're going to see worksheets, you're going to see tips and tricks, you're going to have checklists and resource sheets, everything at your disposal, inshallah. So I'm just going to keep th go through. Bismillah. So the first thing I like to do is I like to have a stop and reflect. What does your typical daily schedule look like? When, on a consistent basis, some of you guys might be work, some parents, some might be students. What does your daily schedule look like? When you stop and you break that down, can you think about those items on your daily schedule that are absolutely necessary tasks? Can you think of things that you can break down in that schedule that might not be necessary? And then for the things that are absolutely necessary, do you think that we can find ways to 
enhance it so that we can better utilize our time. Like Imam Daoud uh, just spoke about, maybe simplifying our meals. I mean, cooking is something that we all have to do. But do we have to spend two hours creating feasts that most times we're not going to be able to eat after we break our fast? So being conscious and reflecting on what we have to do, what's necessary for us on a daily basis, and then putting the steps in place so that we can shorten that time that it's committed from us is just something good to get into the habit of doing on a consistent basis. Just keep reflecting on that. So one thing I like to say is um, for some of the unnecessary tasks that we do, what are some unnecessary tasks that you guys, uh, can anybody in the audience shout some out? Can you think of any? Social media is a very big one. That's a very big, big one for many people these days. So in my Ibad the Swap section, it just, again, has you reflecting. So if you are in social media and you become overloaded, as uh, Ustada Jose said, maybe set some time limits for yourself. You know, instead of being on there for two hours, say, I'm only going to give myself 30 minutes. Or you can try and go the whole month without it. Other alternatives are there are amazing speakers and people to follow that give you inspirational Ramadan tips, that um, get you engaged, that listening, you can recite Quran together, listen to, uh, help you kind of keep you in line. So utilize the resources that you have to your benefits. And then there's lots of other options. For example, if you are somebody who likes to watch the TV and movies during your downtime, there are so many really positive lectures, Islamic movies, inspirational, uh, positive shows that you can uh, gravitate towards during this month just to make your time a little bit more productive and enhanced, inshallah. I'm going to let you guys just read through that, and we'll keep going, inshallah. One of the things that was mentioned a lot is food preparation. Uh, it's the effects that our food has on us. So one of the biggest concepts I've learned is that within ourselves, we have to learn how to balance the different parts of who we are. So we have the mind, the body, and then the heart. So our mind is kind of like our intellectual goals, those aspirations. Our heart are those emotional connections, or as Ustada Hussein said, those purification elements of the heart. And then our bodies are our physical needs, our physical parts. I want you guys to think, when you are extremely hungry, can you go and maybe ace that exam? Not usually. What about if you heard some really bad, sad news that have you, has you physically in anguish? Like, I'm sorry, that has you emotionally in anguish. What happens to your physical energy levels? A lot of times they're down. So being conscious of what it takes as an individual to be productive in all elements is understanding all these different parts of ourself. So one of the things I like to say is for our physical selves, being conscious of the types of food that we put into our body and the effects it has on us is important. SubhanAllah, in our prophetic sunnah, there are so many foods that are mentioned. And when we think about these foods, we look and we see all of their health benefits. Like SubhanAllah, I get goosebumps thinking about that. Because what we're taught in our sunnah is not just lessons to, yeah, okay, that's a yummy treat. SubhanAllah, there are so much wisdom and benefits to us as individuals. If we are eating a lot of, you know, deep fried Oreos, chicken, all this heavy stuff, are we going to have the energies to get to tarawiyah? If we want to set a goal that every night we're getting to tarawih, we're going to pray qiyam, what are some of the practical steps that we can put in place to actually achieve those goals? So food is a really big one. A lot of people say, well, I like my food. You know, it's my tradition. It's my culture. And that's absolutely true and necessary. It's a positive thing. So instead of just throwing out the tradition, keep the tradition, but refine the recipes. There are a lot of healthy alternatives to some of the heavier elements in our recipes that taste just as good, 
take just as much time, but will have a different effect on our energy levels. So I go through quite a few, and you guys can get the idea, inshallah. So <laughs> me personally for Ramadan, I don't want to make it about food. I don't want to spend, honestly, any of my time in the kitchen preparing, cooking, and cleaning up after it. <laughs> a lot of us uh, know how much time that can take. So personally, what I've done, I was um, a family of six. I would cook and prepare all of my meals for three months. One month prior to Ramadan, one month for the month of Ramadan, and then one month after. So that everything was done. That I didn't have to think about, worry about food at all. So this is one of my, this was one of my family's personal, uh, one of the things that, uh, and in, excuse me, that helped enhance my time during Ramadan the most. Because when we actually, like that schedule I told you guys to think about where our, all of our time goes on a daily basis, a lot of it ends up going to food. So it would take me maybe six, seven days of hard work, but then three months of not thinking about it. So I go through a lot of different tips and tricks on food preparation in here and a lot of the myths that people have. So typically at these type of workshops, I will actually have had food provided and people would eat and enjoy ahead of time so that you guys can have the energy for this long lecture and discussion. But what I don't tell them is all of the food is actually freezer meals. And then after they've eaten it, they're like, what? No. Because knowing the little tips and tricks and actually trying and giving it a chance, you realize that there's not much of a difference. And then you kind of gravitate your diet and you make good choices based on that. So imagine lots of soups, stews, chilies. Um, and if you don't want to actually have fully cooked meals, then just focus on one part of it. Just marinate your meats. That by itself, think about it. If we had, instead of marinating one different kind of meat every single day, we marinated maybe five pounds of it and had it over the course of a few days, does that not simplify and save time in the long run? Save with cleanliness? We'll just throw it all in the food processor, wash it one time. So subhanAllah, these little tips and tricks really help us maximize our time. And food prep is a very big helpful one. Now, we don't, we don't have as much time. We have about one week left for Ramadan. So a couple of sisters asked me, well, we only have one week left. How much food prep can we actually get done in one week? You can get a lot done. Every day this week for the next maybe six, seven days, double your meals. You're cooking anyway. Just double it and freeze one. Then you'll have at least six, seven days worth of meals for those days where you want to make sure you get to tarawih. You want to make sure you do qiyam, but you want to make sure that your family is being fed. Another option would, again, just do meat marination. Get all of that out of the way. Pick one day and do all your food prep. These little tips and tricks help. Uh, for me personally, I, I'm not quite at the extreme level, mashallah, as Imam Daoud, but I will only do smoothies for breakfast. I'll do a date smoothie with bananas every day for suhoor. And honestly, that makes me feel full. It gives me the energy levels. And after Ramadan with this healthy meal preparation, I leave it feeling so revived physically. So subhanAllah, it's not like the rahmah that Ramadan is, it's not supposed to be a burden on us. If we actually go into it with the right mindset, we feel all of its benefits, even its physical benefits. So. so yeah, there's lots of tips and tricks here. One thing I, got, I get asked a lot is, well, we live in these smaller places, especially in California. How can we have the freezer space? So I, I get into all of that. You can just get freezer bags. You can freeze them flat, and you can stack 10, 20 meals easily, even in the smallest of freezers. And depending on the size of your family, like you guys will adjust, and you can figure out what works best for you, inshallah. You also save money, you guys. Buying food in bulk. Buying meats and vegetables in bulk actually helps you save it in the long run. So you'll have more money to donate for sadaqah and zakah, inshallah, for Ramadan. Here I just go through a quick recipe renovation of like a healthy kind of meal prep idea for one day in Ramadan. 
in the workbook, because I told you there's an accompanying workbook, inshallah, you'll find lots of different tools to help you maximize on it. So you have the suhoor or, or menu plan, the dinner iftar menu plan, and then the grocery lists. And then to help you, assist you with, if you do decide to go with freezer meals, what's in your freezer? To just know what you have and then organize yourself accordingly. So the one reason I did the grocery list for every single week of Ramadan, because again, shopping happens to be one of the bigger items that takes our time. So if we have a grocery list and we know what we're going into the store to buy, we're going to be fast and we're going to be efficient. We're also not going to be going into the store hungry, buying a bunch of things that we don't need, both unhealthy and wasteful. So organizing that grocery list, going and being disciplined to only get what's on there really helps us stay focused for our goals, inshallah. And as we said, we really don't want to spend Ramadan with a lot of waste. Alhamdulillah, we are fasting during the day. And we have to be aware of our physical capacities. And oftentimes, we can't eat as much as our minds are tricking us into thinking we can because we're fasting. So planning now while you are not fasting helps kind of visualize that. So as, again, Imam Daud, mashallah, said, we want to welcome Ramadan as a guest. If we have guests coming into our house, we go through and we do the deepest cleaning, we're scrubbing, we're organizing, we're getting everything ready and prepared. We are so excited that these people are coming into our homes, our personal spaces. Well, with Ramadan coming, Ramadan is our guest. So I would highly recommend going through a nice deep clean prior to Ramadan. These are all steps that you can do before Ramadan. So that when you come into it, you come into it with the mindset like, Okay, this is my environment. This is fresh. Set up a little prayer space for yourself. Have a masalla. Put on uh, your mushaf, your tasbih. Have all your adqad in one place, place. It really helps you kind of get into the right mind space to best utilize your environment. And then the other thing is, you know, you've gotten a little bit of a head start for Eid. <laughs> so it helps. Alhamdulillah. Obviously, we're still going to have the everyday daily cleaning. But doing that deep cleaning... You know, it really makes a big difference. Um, alhamdulillah. I like to use that example. Um, you know, when we are getting ready to cook and we go into the kitchen, if it's messy, do we want to clean? Do we want to cook, I mean? Nobody wants that. So with Ramadan coming, make sure your environment is welcoming of it. And so this is also kind of the fun element, if, if you, especially if you have kids, decorate. There are a lot of simple, affordable ways to decorate the house. Inshallah, I saw a bunch of decorations outside by the vendors. If you guys want to take even the simpler route, you can just grab some. <laughs> Inshallah. But this, the, the sheets that I have just help you kind of give you that checklist. Remember things that you might not necessarily have remembered. Oh, another huge time saver. So... One year, it was Ramadan, and it was the last 10 nights of Ramadan. And I was like, oh my goodness, I have to go buy gifts. I need to eat clothes for my kids. What am I going to do? So naturally, what do we do? We get in the car, and we go to the mall. While I was there, I was shocked. I mean, I shouldn't be shocked I was there. But it was filled with Muslimin. Like every single store, I saw so many. I, there were probably more Muslims in the mall that time than anybody else. And I kept thinking, I was like, this is the last 10 nights of Ramadan. This is precious time. And we're spending it in the mall. So subhanAllah, we have one week left. If the only thing you do is prepare for Eid, get the outfits done, get the decorations done, get all the gifts done now, imagine that's one less thing to spend your last, uh, during your last 10 nights, inshallah. So again, yeah, lots of organizers to help you guys remember and so you don't forget anyone. The next big thing that uh, I found really helped save time for me, um, as I mentioned, I have four young boys. And alhamdulillah, these days there are, are so many products and people that inspire us to engage a love of learning with our kids, especially during Ramadan. 
So when I began, my kids are a little bit older now, but when I began many years ago, there wasn't as many things that we had available to us. So I wanted to make sure that Ramadan wasn't spent just, you know, depriving ourselves of food and then sticking the kids in front of the TV for long periods of time just because we were exhausted. So what I decided to do was help organize my time and activities for the kids in advance. So again, prior to Ramadan, this is another thing you guys can start planning from now. So everybody likes Taco Tuesday, right? How about Tefsir Tuesdays? Get your family in the habit of getting these fun activities together. Grab Ramadan or Islamic-themed books. You know, there are so many actually amazing uh, Islamic games as well that they can play and be um, entertained with during this month that have positive Islamic values. So knowing these things and doing a little bit of time and research, maybe purchasing them in advance, or planning your own activities. You know, this is the time to do it, alhamdulillah. And then again, the calendar and the planner just helps you find it all in one place. And I know, sometimes we just get to those points, we're working, we're exhausted, and we will use the screens. It's inevitable. There is going to be those moments where we are feeling exhausted. So what I highly suggest in those moments is have yourself a YouTube playlist with positive Ramadan content for kids. We have the things that feature Isma al-Husna, the names of Allah. We have beautiful Islamic nasheeds. We have all of these different things, again, to enhance our Ramadan experience, but also being mindful of our physical limitations and our, our emotional you know, pushing points. So utilize the resources that we have. Just prep it now so that when you're in Ramadan, you're not like scrambling, wait, is that a good content? Is that a good thing? You have something already uh, gravitated towards your children or your family's needs, your siblings' needs. You can be, uh, uh, get the hasanat for helping family out. So, inshallah, it's just something to be reflective of and, and to help in your planning, inshallah. So now we've thought about everyone else. What about our spiritual goals? What about ourselves? Do we want to finish a Qur'an khutmah this month? Do we want to memorize new du'ats? Do we want to um, be more involved in the communities and help with the uh, endeavors that they've already started and facilitated? You know, writing down your daily routine, your daily goals, will help kind of keep yourself on track. So again, when you're tired and you need some kind of inspiration, you can go back like, oh, I wanted to do that today. And again, if, if you need to, there are a lot of amazing resources online and virtually where they have 30 days of beautiful content to follow along with. So that's why I always add the links because we can use technology to our benefit, inshallah, especially during Ramadan. So to help you set your spiritual goals, I have a ton of content, <laughs> alhamdulillah. So I told you I'm very big about intellectual goals, emotional goals, and then also physical goals. So for um, kind of reflecting on the type of different types of ibadah or worship, it's just, it's very helpful. So in here you'll find tons of reflection and writing prompts to get you thinking about all the different elements of our religion. It teaches you how to read, it doesn't teach you, it guides you on how we can read hadith and then not just read it as it is, but learn how to interpret it within ourselves and what the lessons we can benefit from and start actually implementing within our lives, inshallah. And then it's just positive guides to be reflective. For example, having better khushu in our prayer. We're all at different levels. so. Each thing is just meant to help us improve. So when we leave Ramadan, we're feeling like we are one step ahead of where we were coming into it, inshallah. So like I said, there's going to also be tons of helpful resource sheets. So I like to call this uh, also, it's not just preparing for Ramadan, but it's also what I like to use as my ibadah binder. Like, it has everything easily accessible for me. So if I'm going to the masjid, I want, I'll just grab it and go. So it has Isma al-Husna in it. It has it written in Arabic, the transliteration and the meaning. It has al-Qar and, and the helpful benefits of them. It has all the different types of du'ats that you can utilize throughout the month and daily kindness challenges or good deed challenges so that we can give unto others. As Ustada Hussein said, we are a, uh, we are a religion that 
really emphasizes being there for one another in our community. So setting those daily goals for ourselves is really important as well, such as Sirat al-Rahim, maintaining family ties. So there's a checklist to kind of help you remind, remind yourself, hey, you know what, let me call them. You know, we have long commutes. How can we utilize our commutes better? We can call family member. We can listen to Quran. We can do our morning adhqar. SubhanAllah. We have lots of opportunities. So these will just help guide you and facilitate it. Uh, one of the things that I love to do, um, especially with, uh, for younger kids and yourself, is if you're looking to, uh, to memorize some dots for Ramadan, what I like to do is I like to copy it maybe on cardstock paper and then I'll cut it out and I'll tape it into the area where it's most relevant. So when I was uh, earlier, when I was still learning and, and getting familiarized with certain dot, for example, the dot for traveling, every time I got in the car, I printed it out and I put it on my dashboard. So when I got there, I was like, oh, oh yeah, I have to say that dot. And then the repetition of continuously saying it helps you memorize it, alhamdulillah. So do this with any kind of dot that you're wanting to incorporate. You know, the one where you're looking into the mirror when you're leaving the house. There are so many beneficial ones that we can kind of incorporate into our day. One thing I want to mention before I go on is, you know, Ramadan is, alhamdulillah, a prime time to fast. Uh, but it's not only about the fasting. There are many people that can't fast for different reasons, whether it be for females being incapable at certain times, sickness, or age. So like I said, there are tons of checklist organizers and calculators in here. Um, for physical goals, uh, exercise for me is, is very important for my emotional state of being. So being self-aware, as Ustada Hussein said, has taught me that I need to release some of my energy sometimes. So I have to kind of incorporate times for physical exercise for my emotional intellectual goals. So one of the ways that I kind of advise this, if during Ramadan, um, there are actually tips and tricks within it, but one of the ways that I advise too, if you feel like, like you don't have time, is simple little tricks like if you're going to go to Tarawiyah, park far. <laughs> intentionally park far. You'll find better parking spaces and then that walk to Tarawiyah would do your health a lot of good inshallah. So little things like that. It's just reframing every act that we do consciously to give us the best chance to accomplish our goals. So another thing that I highly advise is um, vitamins. You know, understanding what our bodies might be lacking, especially during Ramadan when we aren't eating sometimes the most balanced diets. Uh, you know, we might need a little bit of additional help. For me personally, with my gut health, probiotics changed my Ramadans. I was always feeling sick and weighed down. Then when I started taking probiotics consistently throughout Ramadan, it really enhanced the experience. I felt more energy. I was able to get through it without feeling sick. So subhanAllah, vitamins, you know, speak with your doctors, speak with a nutritionist, alhamdulillah, see what your body might need to give you that little boost of energy as well. Um, yeah, it also gives lots of tips for Quran khitma, how to organize iftars because, you know, in a, we will most likely have iftars during Ramadan. Um, so if you do, it just being organized, it really helps assist with that. And then if you are going to miss fast, you don't want to, you know, lose track of the days that you didn't fast. So there's a nice organizer in there for that as well. Um, it also discusses the different types of zikah and sadaqah. It gives you tips and tricks for how to finish a Qur'an khitmah within the month of Ramadan. For example, if you only read four pages a day, uh, I'm sorry, not a day, per salah, with each of your five salahs, you'll finish a khitmah in the month. You'll finish completing the recitation of the entire Qur'an, mashallah. So now we have all of these goals set for ourselves. Where do we find the time? We, we talked about like the little tips and tricks to kind of enter it into our lives. But how do we give ourselves bigger blocks of time during Ramadan? For this, I give two options because as individuals, we are going to gravitate our own personal growth in different ways. So it's important to have different 
I, uh, options available to us. So I have the weekly schedule, which is a block calendar. And then we also have the schedule tied to Salah. So when the block calendar, with the block calendar, what you can do is you can write in the time frames throughout your day and then block out all the times that you know that you can't do something. For example, you're at work, you're in class, you're at a kid's activity. Then with the free time blocks that you see, plug it in as if it is work. We wouldn't miss work one day, say, oh, I don't feel like going to work. No, we make the time for it. Ramadan is four weeks long. So if we plug in those ibadah times, those times of worship within our calendar, we should be as consistent with them as we would our normal work schedule or our kids' activities or any other type of event in our lives. So holding ourselves accountable in that manner really helps us stay in line and focused. The second one is our schedule tied to Salah. So a lot of times making something, turning something into a habit becomes easier if we connect it with something that we're already doing. So like I said, for myself, I'm a very physical person. So I wanted to incorporate more exercise in my life, but I had very young kids. So I couldn't think, how can I find that balance for myself? So what I did was every time I was giving them a bath, I would be in the bathroom right there watching them, making sure they were safe. But then I would do crunches or I would do something physical, like some kind of exercise, while I'm sitting there letting them play, have a little bit of fun, but I disciplined myself that way. And so every time they were giving a bath, I got myself so consistently, uh, I tied it so consistently to that, that it became like a routine. We can do that same concept with our ibadah goals tied to our salah. So our salahs are something that grounds us. It reminds us on, uh, throughout the day to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we're doing that and we're taking the time out for prayer, we can add something additionally into that. We can add our Qur'an recitation in there. We can add our adhqar. Or, like we said, you can sit at al maintaining family ties, doing um, positive things, subhanAllah. So we can tie it to our salahs just to help instill within ourselves that habit. So now we're in Ramadan. And we want to make sure that all of these amazing goals we've set for ourselves are actually being attained. What I provided was a daily check-in for yourself. So every day of Ramadan, we have our Salah tracker. We have our fasting tracker, where you are in the Qur'an. And then some points for reflection. So we have like a daily Qur'an gem. So what I highly recommend, don't just read, recite the Qur'an. Definitely recite it, inshallah. But try and learn its interpretation. When we do that, when we reflect on its meaning, we have a deeper connection with it, and we're more inspired to continuously read on a daily basis, leaving Ramadan, inshallah. Also, again, we are a community that thinks of others. So trying to do a good deed every single day, a kindness for others, and reflecting on that so we can continuously add more of that on a daily basis is a really positive thing. Now, we have so many pressures, we have so much going on in our lives, how can we keep our emotions in check? How can we help self-regulate ourselves? So on a daily basis, I give le stress less tips. So every day is a different tip to help you find yourself and ground yourself. Just so that on a consistent basis, we can become more aware when we are feeling emotionally imbalanced, and we can put the steps in place to help self-regulate ourselves. Then, of course, sadaqah and zakah. Ramadan is the best time to do our yearly zakah. And alhamdulillah, if we t put in that amount, especially the last 10 nights, it again keeps us on track and keeps us giving, inshallah, purifying our wealth. And then just for those who are, uh, especially, I love this one. I used to love doing it with my kids, and I love it for myself. I like having trivia challenges, but Islamically themed trivia challenges. Because like Imam Dawood said, we want to kind of make this, like our religion, engaging and, and interesting. So by having some funner elements for our kids, making it interesting, it just helps us stay on track. Then also reflection section. 
setting exercise goals for ourselves, making sure we're drinking enough water so that we are feeling energized, and then also the healthy food or dates of the day. Now we have a little less than a week left to Ramadan. This is the last part. How can we kind of take everything, all of our goals, all of our aspirations, and how can we break it into a to-do list for ourselves? Don't think that tomorrow you're going to be able to sit there and get everything done and, done and you're going to be uh, miraculously prepared for Ramadan. No, you have a week left. Every day set for yourself compartmentalize your tasks into easy digestible amounts so that you're not feeling overburdened or overstressed prior to welcoming and coming into Ramadan, inshallah. And again, uh, one thing that I love to emphasize is utilize the resources in our community. MashaAllah, we have a wealth of knowledge. Um, we have amazing food vendors. We have so much available to us that if we just consciously uh, realize everything that we have and then utilize them in those times where we are feeling exhausted, alhamdulillah, we're giving back to our community, but at the same time, we're helping ourselves. So being mindful of that is um, just something I like to promote. And then this is the final slide, inshallah. Leaving, uh, we were talking predominantly about preparing for Ramadan. But I also really want us to get into the habit of, okay, what, how can I take what I've done and how I've benefited in Ramadan and how can I move it forward? So one of the best things is just to kind of find balance within ourselves by setting goals in the different parts of who we are. So our mind, our body, and our heart are different types of goals that we can set for ourselves. And then, inshallah, we can turn these things into habits. And next Ramadan, we'll just keep adding and adding and adding, inshallah. So, alhamdulillah, um, I think I've talked quite a bit. <laughs> I wanted to ask if you guys had any questions, any feedback, reflections. Sorry. Is there like a soft, soft copy version of this book? I'm sorry, what? A soft copy version, a printable copy? Um, there's not, but it's available on Amazon and Etsy, and uh, we have it on the vendor store outside. Uh, the well. physical book or the soft copy? Uh, the physical book. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Inshallah, no problem. Any other comments, questions, reflections? Mashallah, this was an easy group. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Thank you for sharing. They seem like really beneficial tips, especially the time saving in the kitchen one. Um, so I had a question. So I know you talked a bit about women who might not be fasting during Ramadan. So I'm breastfeeding uh, this Ramadan. I don't think I'll be able to fast. Do you have any advice specifically for breastfeeding mothers um, on how to make the m most of this Ramadan? Because we won't be fasting. I feel like I'll miss out on a lot of um, feeling, you know, spiritually in touch yeah. with the month. Yeah, alhamdulillah. This was something I feel like is very prominent in our community. Is like we kind of tie all of our spiritual connection to the ritualistic aspects of worship. But subhanAllah, like um, Ustad Jose was saying, there are so many emotional connections between our religion. So uh, in, the in the workbook, uh, we talk about adhqar, going over Isma al Hasna, names of Allah, you know, really connecting with the different parts of our religion, uh, setting intellectual goals for ourselves, donating and vo volunteering your time at the communities. I know you have an, a newborn, so it might be a little bit more difficult with your time. But just being a part of these experiences, don't feel like just because you're not fasting that you can't be engaged, you can't be a part of these type of things. And then there are so many goals that you can set for yourself that I've gone over and there are worksheets for it that aren't tied to fasting. So um, one thing that I used to do, because I have four boys, alhamdulillah, was um, I would set a lot of my memorization goals during Ramadan. Um, 
So I would um, do my morning athqar, try and memorize du'ats, and memorize a lot of the Qur'an, as much of the Qur'an as I could during those times where I wasn't fasting. So at least I felt like I had that connection with the Qur'an when I couldn't feel like my physical connection with the fasting was there. Um, and as well, even, although you're, you're breastfeeding, you could still do all of the uh, fard salahs and the sunnah salahs. Um, maybe take turns, if it's possible, with your spouse to go to tarawih, to be engaged in that congregation with the community. It, it really does help your morale um, as, as, a, as a mom, a new mom, mm -hmm. alhamdulillah. Exactly. And then definitely halakas and lectures. I really want to thank MCC for hosting. Jazakallah khair. Thank you, Brother Munir, for all of your efforts, alhamdulillah. And Imam Dawood and Ustad Hussein for contributing, alhamdulillah. Um, Imam, yeah. He left. Okay, khalas. Inshallah. I really wanted him to finish with the du'a, but mashallah, they both finished their sections with the du'a. So um, I'll just close off. And alhamdulillah, jazakallah khairan again. I pray that we all make it to Ramadan. I pray we benefit from this month. Anything that you may have benefited from today is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything that was wrong or incorrect is solely from me, inshallah. Wa'ayakum. Wa'ayakum.